Amid the Blue Ridge Mountains, where the Shenandoah River meets the Potomac, at the border of Virginia and Maryland, lay Harper's Ferry. Thomas Jefferson described the scene as so stunning that it was, quote, worth a voyage across the Atlantic. George Washington himself had selected Harper's Ferry as the site for a federal armory. Far from the ocean and protected by rivers and mountains, he knew that it would be difficult for a foreign army to seize. But these same qualities made it particularly susceptible to an army of homegrown insurrectionists, as an abolitionist named John Brown well understood. Brown was a man of deep religious zeal, who believed it was his duty to God to liberate those in bondage in the American South. Harper's Ferry was the key to his plan. Brown, who was nearly 60, intended to recruit a band of loyal followers that would invade the armory and seize large numbers of weapons. From there, they would go from plantation to plantation, freeing slaves and mustering them into their guerrilla army. Brown believed that as they spread throughout the South, the Northern states would overthrow the existing government and establish an abolitionist one. At least this was his vision. The truth is that on the evening of October 16th, 1859, as John Brown and his men approached the bridge over the Potomac leading to Harper's Ferry, none could know the fate awaiting them on the other side of the river. One of the most engaging accounts of the events surrounding the raid is Tony Horowitz's book, Midnight Rising, which I draw from today. Brown had recruited 21 men, including his own sons, to join him on his mission. They first tried to take the night watchman on the bridge hostage, but he managed to run away and take refuge in a local hotel where he warned the innkeeper that there were robbers on the bridge. What the watchman couldn't have guessed was that the property these men intended to seize were fellow human beings. By midnight, John Brown had control of the town's railroads, bridges, and crucially, the arsenal, which housed 100,000 firearms. Incredibly, not a single shot had been fired yet. The guard at the armory was on the lookout for accidental fires, not invading bands of abolitionists. He didn't even carry a gun. With Harper's Ferry firmly in his grasp, Brown wasted little time moving on to the heart of the mission, the deliverance of slaves to freedom. At 1.30 in the morning, several of Brown's men arrived at a slave plantation five miles west of Harper's Ferry, owned by Lewis Washington, the great-grandnephew of George Washington. Lewis Washington was taken hostage at gunpoint, and several of his male slaves joined Brown's men for their journey back to Harper's Ferry. Lewis Washington's close proximity to Harper's Ferry was not the only reason that Brown targeted his estate. As Brown informed him upon Washington's arrival to the arsenal, I wanted you particularly for the moral effect it would give our cause, having one of your name as our prisoner. Around the same time that Lewis Washington was awakened by intruders, the first shots were exchanged at Harper's Ferry between the men at the armory and the clerk of the hotel where the night watchman had escaped to. Over the next several hours, Brown took an increasing number of hostages from unlucky passers-by to armory employees who had showed up for work early in the morning. He informed the hostages that his aim was to free slaves, not to kill white Southerners but he was prepared to do the latter in order to accomplish the former. Brown also decided to allow a train to pass through the town and made its conductor aware of his purposes. He wanted the world to know that Harper's Ferry had been seized in the name of freedom. Word quickly spread by telegraph to newspapers in eastern cities. Rumors greatly exaggerated the size of Brown's force with some estimates of 750 men, rather than the 21 he actually had in his service. Around 7 a.m., shots rang out again. This time, an Irish tavern keeper had opened fire on the armory and was mortally wounded in retaliation. Townspeople grew alarmed. Someone recalled that not all of the guns at the armory were in the arsenal. Some had been moved uh, to another location beyond Brown's reach, 
and two locals rushed to gather them. Women and children collected lead plates and spoons to melt down into bullets. By 10 a.m., men were gathering in nearby Charlestown, a community dependent on slave labor, and soon they joined with other locals to create a ragtag militia, 150 strong. A firefight opened between this band and Brown's own. The first casualty on Brown's side was soon claimed. A former slave named Dangerfield Newby, who had joined Brown in the hopes of freeing his family, still in chains, only miles away. Dangerously outnumbered, Brown's militia struggled to maintain control of the town. So Brown released several hostages and one of his own followers to broker a ceasefire under the flag of truce. But the resistance fighters in Harper's Ferry failed to honor the truce flag and captured Brown's militant. Brown sent out two more of his men, waving a handkerchief which intended their peaceful desire to negotiate. These men were promptly shot. Brown intended to conduct himself according to the rules of war, and he was outraged that these Virginians failed to execute their counterinsurgency with honor. By late afternoon, the counterinsurgency breached the armory and forced Brown's men to take cover in an engine house on the property. The firefight died down around 5 p.m., and a member of the counterinsurgency approached in the hopes of brokering a ceasefire. Brown communicated his desire to be allowed to pass the bridge to the other side of the Potomac, where the Virginians could then begin to fire on him. While Brown was hardly in a position to make such a demand, he felt that he was owed generous terms because he had chosen not to kill civilians and could have burned down the town and did not. Colonel Robert Baylor, who had taken command of the counterinsurgency, balked at Brown's request. At midnight, 90 Marines, 9-0 Marines, arrived in Harper's Ferry, led by none other than con future Confederate General Robert E. Lee, who was at the time a colonel in the U.S. Army. Both sides settled in for the night, unsure how this standoff would end. At dawn, Lee dispatched a message to Brown informing him that his uprising was now besieged and he had no choice but to surrender or risk death. Brown responded that he would prefer to die. At this, Lee's messenger waved his hat to indicate that the Marines should proceed with their attack. They began to pound on the doors with sledgehammers, I'm sorry, with hammers. Um, the Marines then traded their hammers for a ladder, which they employed as a battering ram, forcing open a small hole through which they were able to climb through one at a time. Some of the insurgents surrendered, but Brown was determined to give his life for his cause. As he was reloading his gun, a lieutenant had an opportunity to deal Brown a lethal blow, and he intended to seize it. He thrust his sword at Brown, but the edge of the blade hit a buckle or a button and bent the sword. Within minutes, the Marines had rescued the hostages, captured Brown, and seized or killed the last of his men. Two of Brown's sons were among the dead. Brown had been badly injured in the fighting and taken into the paymaster's office, where it was suspected he might die. Virginia Governor Henry Wise arrived on the scene and wished to interrogate the leader of this ill-fated insurrection. In polite but unapologetic terms, Brown outlined for the governor his intention of establishing a new state premised on the freedom of all men. While Wise despised what Brown stood for, he could not help but respect the man. Wise said of Brown, he is a bundle of the best nerves I ever saw cut and thrust and bleeding in bonds. He is a fanatic, vain and garrulous, but firm and truthful and intelligent. The trial of John Brown commenced in Charlestown on October 25th, a week following his raid. The scene inside the courtroom was carnivalesque. People packed in by the hundreds, snacking on nuts. There was Brown, still injured, lying on a cot in the middle of the court. Virginia intended to follow the necessary legal formalities that would culminate in Brown's hanging. For his part, Brown had no intention of trying to win in court. His death sentence was a certainty. His aim 
was to render, was to render his trial in service of his larger goal. The eyes of the nation were now fixed upon him, and Brown wanted to use his trial as a forum to give voice to the cause of abolition. N but even the northern press derided him as a madman. Brown's previous supporters largely abandoned him. The jury, of course, found Brown guilty, and on November 2nd, he appeared in court for his sentencing. The court clerk asked Brown if he wished to say why he should not receive the death penalty. Brown did not let the moment pass. The words that followed would stir the soul of the nation. He said, had I so interfered on behalf of the rich, the powerful, the intelligent, the so-called great, every man in this court would deem it an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. This court acknowledges too the validity of the law of God. I see a book kissed here, which I suppose to be the Bible, that teaches me, remember them that are in bonds. Now, if it is deemed necessary that I should forfeit my life for the furtherance of the ends of justice and mingle my blood further with the blood of my children and the blood of millions in this slave country, so let it be done. Here he was in a southern courtroom with eloquence and conviction, issuing his own sentence upon those who would enslave their brethren. This courtroom diatribe turned the tide of northern opinion in Brown's favor. The preeminent intellectual in the country, Ralph Waldo Emerson, hailed Brown as, quote, a saint awaiting his martyrdom, and who, if he shall suffer, will make the gallows glorious like the cross. On December 2nd, John Brown headed to the gallows. He was delivered on a carriage, um, and he sat in the carriage on top of his own coffin. The authorities had decided to hang Brown in a field on the edge of town where there were no trees or other markers that would indicate to his acolytes where his hanging had taken place. And so this way they wouldn't be able to consecrate the ground on which he was killed. Virginians were also concerned about a last minute rescue attempt. And so they summoned 1,500 troops to supervise the affair. Upon arriving to the gallows, Brown, a gentleman always, shook hands with the town mayor and prosecutor and bid them farewell. A hood was placed over his head, a noose around his neck, and he was asked to step forward onto the trap door. All in attendance were stunned by his steely resolve. There was no hesitation in his voice, no anxiety in his movement. Finally, the sheriff cut the rope to the trap door and the abolitionist who had captivated the North's imagination plunged to his death. John Brown's raid on its own did not cause the Civil War, but it exposed the treacherous divide between North and South. Across the Northern states, Brown's death was marked by tolling bells, laudatory speeches, salutes, and prayers. He was no longer a lunatic. John Brown had become a martyr. The South was outraged over this effusive display of Northern sympathy. The North's reaction lent credence to Southern suspicions that even moderate Northerners were really hell-bent on the destruction of slavery. As the abolitionist Wendell Phillips wrote, Virginia did not tremble at an old gray-headed man at Harper's Ferry. They trembled at a John Brown in each man's own conscience. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.